What's up, fellow travelers? Welcome to Traversing the Stars. Please welcome my special guest today, author, screenwriter, director, Caroline Thompson. Caroline, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Absolutely. It's great to have you here. So uh, tell everybody at home a little bit about you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> <We're>... <laughs> oh, that's a general question. Um, well, there's Edward Scissorhands. Love it. <laughs> there's Black Beauty. Uh, there, come here, Tucci. There's my dog somewhere. Come here, Tucci. Tucci, say hi. Come here, puppy. Hey, puppy. This is my office. Uh, I mostly don't write these days. I mostly oil paint. Cool. Uh, okay. I like I like to oil paint dead people and things, animals. That's awesome. So what got you um, oil painting? I mean, I, I honestly, that is the kind of talent like I can't even relate to. I, I, I can't draw to save my life. So like anytime somebody has any, like any kind of talent with like drawing or, or painting or anything like that, it just blows my, blows me away. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. I, I had the same feeling you have, uh -huh. um, but it would have been a lifelong dream to paint. And so I found a teacher and Turns out I'm pretty good at it, actually. That's awesome. I've uh, been doing it for a few years now, and I love and I love it. And it's very meditative. It's very similar to writing in that you just mm -hmm. get lost in what you're doing. Um, but it's not for hire, so that's a nice thing. Um, yeah. I live I live near the beach in California, which is sad. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I was gonna say I don't live anywhere near a beach, so uh, a little bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice. Cool. Well, so you got your start in the industry uh, collaborating with Penelope Spheris, who uh, obviously as a metalhead, I love Penelope. I uh, love her work on obviously Wayne's World, um, Decline of Western Civilization. So how was it? Getting, how was that getting started with her? Well, so I wrote a novel mm -hmm. um, and I had I was living in L.A. Mm -hmm. I didn't move to L.A. to be in the movie business. I moved to L.A. to get as far away from the East Coast where I'm from as I possibly could. I get that. I'm on um, the East Coast. <laughs> stay on the continent. So that's how I wound up in LA. Um, and, but I, but my lifelong dream had been to write and publish a novel, which mm -hmm. I did. Uh, but I, by that time, had become fascinated by the movie business. So mm -hmm. there were three people I wanted to direct that novel. One was David Lynch, because mm -hmm. it has... A connection to a razor head my book mm -hmm. uh the other was brian De palma because carrie uh, his carrie is my favorite movie of all time love it love and De the palma. third was penelope spheres because i thought i thought the decline of western civilization was her genius absolutely um yeah so the um agent who had been kind of browbeated to helping me uh -huh. turns out to, to to have worked at the agency where penelope was represented so the other two directors weren't at that agency so mm. he he took the short route and went straight to yeah. Penelope luckily she loved the book and wanted to um adapt it and I mm -hmm. said well I'd really like to learn how to write screenplays so I will give you an option on the book for one dollar if mm -hmm. I can write the script with you and so that's what we did and um this was in the early 80s mm -hmm. I my dad for a wedding gift had mm -hmm. given my then husband and myself computers for our wedding. Mm -hmm. Well, this computer weighed 40 pounds. <laughs> it was the size of a sewing machine. The yeah. screen was this big. <laughs> and if you wanted to see, you had to scroll back and forth, you Ooh. know, after like three letters to see what you were writing. Yeah. But you could also, you could put in an external monitor. So, um, the deal that Penelope and I made was that I would come to her house with my computer mm -hmm. and she would cook lunch. And I was smart enough at that time to know that I wanted to have my hands on the keyboard. Yeah. Because then you can edit as you go along, right? right. <laughs> Just right kind of shape it how you right see now. it. Yeah. Yes. Instead of letting that to somebody else, whenever I've right. had a writing partner, I've always been on the keyboard. Um, just call that early self-preservation instinct. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's how Penelope and I got um, connected. And we had, uh, we actually set set the movie up, I think more than once because the mm -hmm. options had lapsed, but but it never got made. 
uh, but it was my introduction to the movie business and her agent, not the same agent that had set me up with her, um, but at the same agency, loved the script so much. He asked if he could represent me and he is still my agent today. That's awesome. Oh, you got to love the long term mm-hmm. relationship like that. That's that's incredible. I think he's my longest term relationship of my life. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to be said for that, for sure. For sure. I am a little bit bummed that it hasn't been made into a movie. I haven't had a chance to read it, but I read the premise of it. And that's a pretty, uh, pretty intense sounding book. Um, so firstborn, uh, and it's about an, a, an abortion that comes back to life. Well, it comes back to its mom. It never died. Uh-huh. It, 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 it survived and it comes, finds its mother. Um, long before there was all this who, you know, you know, like hullabaloo about abortion. If right. if I had known what was coming, I might have not. Um, the metaphor came because on my 21st birthday, my mother wrote me a birthday card. Mm-hmm. My sort of Tourette's mother wrote a birthday mm-hmm. card that said, luckily abortion was not legal in 1956 or you wouldn't be here. <laughs> wow. Which, I, <laughs> which I thought was that the most horrific, the horrific thing and the most hilarious thing I had ever heard of. Um, so the book was kind of a, um, a send up of growing up in suburbia. Yeah. And it, it was really a precursor to Edward Scissorhands. It's the same territory. Right. A much angrier story, mm-hmm. uh, a much more hurt story, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, but very much the same territory. So. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. That's, I got to get my hands on it. I got to check that out. Cause that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. I can't imagine a sadder story though than Edward Scissorhands. I mean, that's, <laughs> that is pretty intense. Well, it, it was angrier and I think sadder. I do. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I was in my twenties when I wrote it and um, working out some things, working out some things. Yeah. And lucky enough to be fluent enough in the language to be able to express what I felt. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And that's kind of how you got, uh, cause, um, that, uh, Tim Burton got a hold of the book and that's how, um, he kind of got, you got, you got on his radar with that. Well, it was a slightly more circuitous path than that, but mm-hmm. basically, yes. Okay. Okay. So how was it working? I mean, you know, Edward Scissorhands is, you know, I mean, there, there's going to be several of your works that are going to be appearing on a uh, list of like classic movies until the end of time. I mean, you know, I just watched well, from, Night, Nightmare on Elm Street. Or, from your uh, lips to God's ears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, le- legitimately, like, we just watched uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. We do it every year, like, right around this time. So, I mean, how does it feel, like, you know, having, you know, being a part of that, those legacies? They're such massive legacies. And, you know, Edward Scissorhands is such a recognizable character. It's a total pinch me on dreaming experience. Uh, I mean, what what would a screenwriter who we largely go unrecognized right more, more than largely i mean if you ask anybody most people think tim burton wrote both of his movies and right he didn't either of them right um but it was fun working with tim mm-hmm. we were really good friends uh when we started edward and um people have this fantasy that he stood behind me telling me what to write but that's not true okay <laughs> I wrote it from my mind. Uh, he gave me the absolutely irreplaceable image of mm. the character with scissors for hands. Um, and in a, many ways, um, the script was a love letter to him, not mm. literal love, but, you know, emotional love yeah. about not being able to fit in. And Tim, particularly at that time, was such a lost soul that mm-hmm. uh, he was easy to write about. And, and this was, I mean, before he was a household name, this was when he was still coming up and yeah. I mean, Batman made him a household name, but this. Oh, was, I'm, Dur- yeah, sure. I'm sorry. This, <laughs> I totally Dur- forgot I about it, Batman. <laughs> but I wrote it before Batman mm-hmm. came out. I wrote it before he started to direct Batman. Actually. Okay. Um, so it was um, anyway. So, so yeah, working with him was, a was lovely. And I, I mean, Edward Scissorhands will always remain my favorite uh, experience in the business because it was the rare, rare occasion, my first movie, so I had no idea how rare it is, but right. the rare occasion where everybody was making the same film. 
Mm -hmm. So this sort of very delicate, whimsical, sort of odd tone, everybody, everybody nailed it. Everybody was like on the same page and everybody was just vibing the exact same way. And you have no idea how rare that is. It is oh, like I imagine. Almost impossible. But I imagine. Happens. Yeah. Well, you have a good imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've worked in like, you know, small groups of five people and that, you know, that in itself could be so a, a movie production, you know, you hear horror stories all the time. So, I mean, that's, so, I mean, that's gotta be like really ex- extremely special to you that, you know, especially for your first movie that you got to experience that level of like synchronicity with the whole production. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it was, it was ridiculously special. And I, I, I did appreciate it, but I didn't realize how special it was. I sure. Honestly, yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of like, you know, kind of just growing. I mean, you know, you kind of, you don't realize like how good you have something until you, until you're, you know, on to the next thing or, you know, something like that. I totally get that. Until somebody's bludgeoning you <laughs> and, and telling you you're not funny and you can't write or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so i mean it wasn't even just uh you know edward scissorhands i mean you were you were involved with i mean so many movies in the 90s like you know there's um uh, totally uh blanking on the adam's family adam's mm-hmm. family i mean what was that like getting to work on that because i mean i feel like that was kind of like one of the first times that like they took a property like that from you know a show and made it into a movie I guess, you know, Charles Adams was a very famous cartoonist Mm -hmm. who published in The New Yorker. And when I was a kid, one of my great joys was looking at his cartoons in The New Yorkers. And I I love the TV show, but mostly I thought of it as an homage to Charles Adams. It didn't really get to stay that way. It got much broader than dry. But um, so that was an interesting one because I was sort of, seduced into doing a big movie like that which you know is not really me um and I don't think I ever got seduced again into a big movie because <laughs> it's not really what I what where I live but right. I met I met I, it, Scott Rudin the producer introduced Larry Wilson and myself mm-hmm. Larry was one of the Beetlejuice writers mm-hmm. completely coincidentally yeah and um and we got along so well, we said, sure, that'd be fun. Let's let's do it. Mm-hmm. And so um, I don't know how many, you know, we spent at least 18 months just laughing yeah. in, my, in my office. And I think we finally wrote something. And <laughs> <laughs> just throwing eventually, ideas back and forth. <laughs> yeah. And eventually it found its way to the screen, but mostly we just, you know, laughed it up. <laughs> love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. You may have kind of, started to answer this next question a little bit but uh you know like you you even mentioned with your oil painting i mean you know there's like you know kind of a macabre vibe to it but like you know it's like this i've noticed a mix of like macabre and also family friendly so like how do you find the middle ground with that well um first of all kids are the smartest people on earth you Mm -hmm. can't pull anything off on them so absolutely if, if you're being um manipulative Mm -hmm. or insincere or you think you can outsmart them forget about it right um and they love um you know sort of dark spooky things Mm -hmm. uh interestingly um nightmare before christmas was originally uh a disney film Mm -hmm. and then when we finished it the executives at disney got frightened because they thought little kids, this is too much for little kids. It's, it, it's gotta be for teenagers and adults. So we'll put it under our other imprimatur, which is touchstone. Yeah. So it did not come out, out under the Disney, Disney label. It came out under the touchstone label, but I knew kids were going to love it simply because Danny Elfman's daughter, Molly, who was five mm-hmm. years old at the time, could not stop singing those songs. Yeah. Could not stop. And I knew little kids would love it. Mm-hmm. And little kids do love it. And they still love it. I mean, it's crazy how alive uh, you know, it's still my I, I I don't have kids of my own, but I mm-hmm. married a man who had who has kids. And, and so through him, I have grandkids and my seven year old granddaughter mm-hmm. is Sally every year, not because of anything I push on her, but she's obsessed with Sally and her little sister. It goes as zero the dog. That's awesome. 
<laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> Well, and they're just these. I should I should put the Sally picture up here so it's behind me. She's a she, her mom made the most incredible costume, and the kid is so you know it's 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 great. Her she even made her a trick or treat bag, patchwork like Sally's dress. I mean, That's it, awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. I have to agree with you. I think I, I don't think people give kids enough credit. I think like because when this came out, I mean, I remember when this came out. It was massive, and yeah. You know, How I, we, old were you? Ooh, let's see. What year did it come out? What was the year? Was it 90? 1992 or three? I can't remember which. I was. Were you even born yet? Seven or eight years old when that came out. Uh-huh, okay. And I so I remember being thing. like, "This is awesome! Yeah. Like, what is this? Like, and it was yeah. just like you know." It, you know, and I've always, I've always like kind of loved the, you know, like you said, the spooky, the kind of creepy. I've always been drawn to the horror genre, even since I was a little kid. So this was just yeah. like, it's like, this is a cartoon of a horror movie kind of. And it's like, but it's also Christmas, which I also love Christmas. So I just remember losing my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not, you weren't alone. You got to lose your mind with a whole group of people. And now like <laughs> new generations are doing it all over. And I love it. I know. It, that's pretty wild. I remember I was at a film festival in Spain in this this. Sitges Film Festival in Spain with a film. And um, one of the European reporters said, well, how does it feel to have written the most beloved cult movie on the planet? I was mm-hmm. like, what? What movie? <laughs> I didn't know which movie he was talking about, to be honest. Right. There's, I, I, that's, a, a, that's a high class problem to have. I didn't know yeah. if he was talking about <laughs> Edward or Nightmare, but it turns out he was talking about Nightmare. And um, um Every square I've ever been to of of cities in Japan, in mm-hmm. Spain, there and in, in England, there'll be like a Jack Skellington on stilts. Mm-hmm. There yeah, it is. He's, he's part of the zeitgeist at this point. He's part of the culture. That's for sure. It's yeah. very cool. My sister, uh, her uh, her class uh, had when she was in high school, uh, their one of their guitar classes had like a Christmas concert thing, and they played "This Is Halloween." at the Christmas concert. So, you know, it's like that, it's even gotten to that point, like high school kids are playing it. That's so Paying tribute to it. (laughs) That's so cool. I love that. Yeah. Oh man. So I want, I do want to ask you about your directorial debut. So with Black Beauty, uh, that was the first time getting behind the director's chair. So how, I mean, were you intimidated by that? Or, I mean, cause up till then you just done writing. That's true. Uh, I should have been more intimidated than I was. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> but, and, you know, people think that uh, that it's sort of like doesn't fit my body of work that I would do something like that. But the fact of the matter is that in my mind, all of my all my movies are animal stories. Mm-hmm. I base every character on an animal mm-hmm. I've known either, you know, in my heart or literally so. Edward Scissorhands was based on my best dog. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that dog was so alert that that mm-hmm. it was as if she could, if she'd had larynx and pharynx and blah blah, uh, you know, you knew she would have been able to speak. But yeah. you know that she was always interested in, and 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 so and, and I'm a big, I'm a horse lover, and mm-hmm. I to this day, and so Black Beauty. When Warner Brothers after Secret Garden asked mm-hmm. me to write Black Beauty, I said, well. I will only write it if I can direct it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Throwing that out there and seeing if it sticks. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, uh, they were a little hesitant, but uh-huh. it stuck. And um, so that was a very uh, overwhelming experience, but I survived it is I guess what, I mean, and I'm proud of the film. I had a, you know, we weren't all making the same movie every day, right. which was very, frustrating especially um, after having such a profound experience on the first go right. round and i tried really hard to communicate but i think we got there tonally uh mm-hmm. you know my t- my sensibility is a lot more whimsical than most people's and so but i think we got there uh um eventually but i, I you know i there were people on you know on set who thought you know they were going to push me around there were mm-hmm. people you know that i mean it, i had like my producer hired, you know, like the cadre of the oldest men in the world. I had a right. thousand years of, 
of filmmaking experience around me, but most of them couldn't remember my name. Right. Because <laughs> they were so old. But <laughs> but they were lovely and and supportive and and eventually, you know, we all had a love fest. Uh, it took a while to get there, but uh but it was really fascinating. I love England. And so it was really great mm-hmm. to live there for six months. And, and uh, you know, it was, yeah, I'm glad I didn't know I should have been better prepared because I just. Well, how do you know? I mean, how do you know when it's the first time doing it? Right. Well, I never even shot a short, you know, I, I right. that was, you know, that's, that's the thing, but you know, I, 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 you know, I'd never been written really a movie before I wrote it. Which is so, Mm-hmm. other than firstborn you know it's sort of like okay well i've watched a lot of movies yeah <laughs> did that killed it did that yeah. killed it like, yeah <laughs> let's see not? how this works so so but i didn't think i was a great director and but i and i didn't really enjoy it to be honest i'm very very um isolated isolated person i really like spending time on my own so yeah it's hard to do when you're you know, the when main center of attention with that <laughs> yeah when like over hundred people are looking at you and going like, what's next gov? You're like, God damn, if I know, yeah, oh, right. well, let's see, you know, there's that hell let's go. But, um, so, but I, I didn't want to feel defeated by it. So I directed a f- couple few more times just to feel like I was, I just didn't have wet feet, right. but like I knew a little bit of what I was doing. So yeah. yeah. And you still found that it's not really, uh, your, um, ultimate cup of tea then. It's not really for me. Um, I I don't I, I have very low blood pressure, so I don't have the stamina <laughs> of a lot of people. And and uh, you know, I can do a fifteen hour work day, but I can't do five fifteen hour work days in a row and be a very happy person. Yeah, so, I totally get that. That takes a toll on you for sure. You know, it's such a. I I I really hope that with all of us women, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, people say, "What is it like to have been a pioneer?" Well. If I thought about it, I would have been terrified. I was, I did, I just was me. Yeah. And, um, but now that there's so many of us doing these jobs, mm-hmm. I'm hoping that our vision of the world, uh, that's not quite so, I mean, I feel like the, the move, movie making is basically based on war making. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, come on, let's tough this out and you know we're we're, we're yeah girl, football yeah. or whatever soldiers and, get in line and get it done yeah 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 and you know and i'm all for get her done but you know a little kinder gentler get her done so yeah. a 10 hour work day suits me just fine and <laughs> much more and, reasonable and, and i feel like you know the work uh, doesn't suffer for that that it actually Agreed. probably benefits from that but it's not as much a you know it's not as much a vision i mean few of the men directors I've worked with, I realized that basically they just don't like to go home. They just yeah. like to be out on the battlefield, like all the time, hmm. you know, going, come on troops and yeah. work harder. And, and, you know, so that sort of macho activity wasn't really me. And yeah. I'm, and the idea of all these people, as I said, going like, you know, what's next. Yeah. I was like, you know, I would be better prepared today, but you know, it's way, it's way gone now. Yeah. Thankfully. Yeah. Well, you know, I think like, you know, kind of what you were saying about how things are changing. I think there is kind of like some kind of social revolution happening where I think we are heading in the right direction. I feel like we're starting to get so. there. I hope I, so too. Yeah. From your lips again, you're doing the lips to God's ears thing a lot today from your lips. <laughs> to God's ears. I, 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 you know, because there's no reason for it to be um, such a physically punishing activity. I just don't really understand why you can't get a good night's sleep and direct a film. Well, I mean, you know, I, I would even say science <laughs> I says put that that on my having a good night's sleep <laughs> <laughs> helps with things. So, I mean, exactly. like, what is it like? There's a study somebody did where it was like after uh, like in, in the normal work day, like nine to five, like around three people are pretty much useless. Like, so, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, the 15 hour work day, like people have got to be exhausted. I mean, I, I've done 12 hour days and that's it's like ooh, too much, too much. Well, I think what's interesting now is I think also technically technologically you, you would mm-hmm. in those days you you would spend so much time waiting to get a, a scene lit yeah there was so much downtime mm-hmm. while that happened and i my guess is that is that that 
that wait around time is so much less now because oh, yeah. of, of the speed of the cameras and that, you know, that everything is so that there's no reason why you have to be there, you know, hour unto hour unto hour, other than some kind of, um, you know, mass sadism or greed on the part of the bosses. Mm. Which I'm sure happens probably more than we want to think. <laughs> You know it does. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've heard. I mean, one of my favorite directors, James Cameron. I've heard that. I mean, I love his work, but I would not want to work for that guy because it's just like some of the stuff I've heard. That dude is intense, and that's just like I don't know, man. <laughs> yes, and he's a very nice guy. I know him, uh, but I wouldn't want to work for him either. <laughs> yeah, no, you can be a nice guy, and, and you know, and not the perfect boss, but yeah. <laughs> Spielberg, Spielberg is the same. He's he's a uh, you know he he beats the troops from what yeah. I understand. Well, mm-hmm. I mean you know there I guess there's there's kind of it's almost like there you know there is something to that with the right personality. I mean Spielberg and you know Cameron are, are you know wonderful filmmakers. Absolutely. But what well, but you know not everybody's a Spielberg. Not everybody's a Cameron. Some people could probably tone it down. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. So. I got a kind of funny kind of I think you'll appreciate this because it's got kind of a macabre nature to it. So when you directed Black Beauty, you directed Sean Bean. Now, Sean Bean is notorious for dying in his movies with Black <laughs> Beauty being a, you know, among a handful of exceptions. So what was it like? What's it like to be one of the directors that hasn't killed Sean Bean? <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, I try to throw was, a little goofy ones in there every now and then. <laughs> He was actually difficult to work with for was me because, yeah, because he, so he was playing the part of a farmer mm-hmm. and he, um, for example, had to drive a cart. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure we used the footage. I can't recall, but anyway, he was just sitting there slouching in the cart. Mm-hmm. Right. And I said, Sean, you know, sit up, be proud. And he said, I'm a farmer. And I said, well, you've got your own rig. You've got your horse. You've got your own land. I mean, this is a great source of pride in the, in the Victorian era, you yeah. know, S- sit up and show us. So we had a disagreement about that. Uh, he was only with me for a few days, so yeah. I didn't get to know him terribly well, but um, no, I didn't kill him. I could have killed him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm involved the horse. <laughs> sit up. I like killing him. <laughs> well that's but, interesting i mean because so he was kind of looking at it from like looking at it from an upper class perspective yes wow that's interesting. i know I, I thought that was a bit shocking especially since he himself is not sort of a posh right i don't think he has a posh. he couldn't have a posh background with that accent he does you know it's just he doesn't right and and yeah. and so to so maybe he was just mirroring the sort of sad sacks he grew up with. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's true. I mean, yeah, that's interesting, though. I wonder. Uh, yeah, it makes you wonder how he got into that headspace. That's I know. I, uh. I you know, and um, and he didn't want to take riding lessons. He learned to ride later, obviously, mm-hmm. on Game of Thrones. He was very good on a horse, but um, so I often just took him off and had him standing next to the horse, like where the horse is drinking from the pond. I just, just stand there, Sean. I know we're over here. Just stand there. Cause yeah. um, you know, he didn't put, you know, he, he seemed not to put, have much interest in what he was doing. And I well, hope shame. he doesn't hear this. But I don't want to hurt his feelings. Uh, I mean, I hope this doesn't make its way to him. Cause that would, that would be me. And that would be no intention of mine to hurt his feelings. He's a lovely guy, but. Um, well, you know, who knows didn't... what was going on at the time either. He may have had something yeah. you know, in, his, in his head that he just wasn't able to get the right focus in or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Benefit and, of he, the doubt. <laughs> and he wasn't as big a star then as he is now. So right. I think he had sort of aspirations. And so, and a lot of the actors on the movie, by the way, I would say, you know, I would say, could you just take a couple of steps to your right because you're blocking our eye line to the horse. It is and, about a horse. <laughs> it's called Black Beauty, and, and this one actor, you know, you're you're wearing a headset, right? right? As the director, and they're mic'd remotely, and I don't think he realized that his mic was still activated. This one actor, and he he said with great offense to an actor beside him, he said, "Did you just hear that she asked me to get out of the way of the horse?" <laughs> <laughs> so, that a few of them had troubles in this arena. I, I, I mean, maybe 
in general. And also, here's the other thing. I was an American directing a beloved British classic. Right. And this is pre-Harry Potter when um, we were being asked by the studio to sort of Americanize dialogue a little bit. Sure make it easier for an American audience to understand the, the words right. and make ask people to speak more slowly. That shifted with Harry Potter, um, luckily, but, and I was pretty resistant to it, but, you know, I would say, you know, could you speak a little slower mm-hmm. or yeah, that inflection is very American. I understand, but that's how I want you to say it right. or, or whatever. So, so, you know, it, it, there wasn't quite the, the love of uh, the American audiences uh, that I think blossomed later. Yeah. Well, that's, and I mean, that makes sense. I mean, that's, you know, kind of culture shock and everybody's, you know, some people are feeling a certain kind of way about it. And Well, and I, and I, we had a Royal premiere of black beauty and mm-hmm. um, I did over here, princess Anne saying something about a yank. Uh, <laughs> directing <laughs> a beloved British you know iconographic uh story so it's like dude we're allies now come on let's just let's put that aside (laughs) and here's the funny thing is that is that genetically i'm more british than most of the people that were on my crew i'm i'm it turns out sadly a hundred percent from the british Isles. yeah genetically well there you go and (laughs) and my and my and my first ad for example his last name was carreras now that is not a british name Right. That's an Italian name. So ironically, I was more British than many of, of the people who claim to be more British than I. So, so really, you, you were the perfect person to direct this movie then. That's it. I, you know, I tried to explain it to them, but, you know. Who hey, they won't listen, nobody, right? Nobody listens to the director, really. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So do you have anything else on your list that you're wanting to accomplish in the entertainment industry? I mean, anything, any other mountains you're wanting to climb? Well, um, you know, I do occasionally uh, entertain the idea of writing a script here and there. Mm -hmm. I am in in talks to do one right now. They all turn out to be animation projects, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, So, yeah, I mean, you know, I I I love writing. I love what Mm -hmm. I do. I do love being micromanaged. Right. And I do love to be paid. So micromanagement is much more prevalent and the salaries are much lower than they used to be. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, it, it takes a very rare thing to draw me, uh, to draw my attention. And that's as it should be. I'm 65 yeah. years old now. I'm an old lady. I, I, I have a lot to do before I go and, and, you know, being somebody's, you know, whipping post is not, anything i need to do absolutely yeah and that's yeah that's the thing is like do do what makes you happy and that's awesome that you're able to do that i love it well and you know i I was really blessed that by and large in the in the business i i I can't think of a single instance where i had to take a job for the money i never did i got to pick and choose and you know i say i love the money well what i really love is a good project is a beautiful project a project the money is just a very nice extra (laughs) it is but I mean, I, 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 I've been called the B word quite a bit um, in my career, but it's only because I care. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I think of these um, projects as my babies and I, yeah. and I, and I put my heart and soul in them and, and I, and I, I really, really care about them. And so I mean, I'm going to fight for them. And if, if I get called names because of it, Oh, well. Oh, well. Yeah. No, I, t- I, I cannot resonate with that enough. Like, that's how I feel about, you know, my creative projects that, you know, I totally, you know, from one creative person to another, I just totally, totally get where you're coming from with that. And that's awesome that you've been able to, you know, kind of make a career out of that. And that's, that's, I, I love it. I love it so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Well, is there any, uh, anything that, uh, any projects you want to plug or any uh, social medias or anything you're wanting to no, I, well, I'm very not social media, so I don't even I don't have much of anything to push. Um, no, it's just me. No problem at all. <laughs> no problem at all. I appreciate you so much for being here. This has been a blast. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your asking.